Welcome to Whiteboard Wednesday. My name is Drew Schul, Vice President, Global Product Strategy at Imperva. Today's topic is uh, where UBA falls short, and specifically we're talking about sensitive data access. So let's get started. We're going to start with um, UBA approaches. I think it helps to kind of frame the conversation a little bit. Um, the most common UBA approach in terms of deployment and type that I'm hearing is basically UBA or user behavioral analytics, or as Gartner calls it, UEBA sitting on top of a SIM. And essentially the use case here is that SIM has failed to deliver on being able to accurately uh, provide actionable uh, data and alerts uh, when looking for things like insider threats and APT and those types of issues that organizations are dealing with. And so UBA has come along basically applying machine learning and data science to automate and provide much more uh, granular correlation in an automated fashion across all these different variables. So again, the most common use case I see is UBA sitting on top of SIM to kind of fix SIM or do what SIM was not able to do natively. And um, one of the you know, approaches I hear, one of the, the questions is, look, we want to be able to implement one UBA that can solve the problem across all of our different feeds coming from our firewall, our IPS, our antivirus, you know, our various APT and endpoint solutions, uh, maybe monitor Active Directory uh, for login, logout, and lateral movement type detection and then taking logs from all different sources, from web servers, from database servers, from, from everything else, and feeding that into the SIM and then having UBA do its, its thing on top of it. The challenge with this, and frankly, is UBA and machine learning is not magic. And when we look at solving it in this kind of a way, we're basically an inch deep and a mile wide. We're basically saying that the machine learning needs to be taught or tuned. The algorithms need to be such that they can understand not only this firewall, so maybe it's Palo Alto or Checkpoint or Juniper, all the different variations of firewall and those logs and how they produce data and, and what they see. Uh, and again, multiply that across all these different log sets. The, the next objection or, or thing I hear is, well, you know, Splunk, for example, has a common data set that is, is solving that problem. So now you've solved one problem, which is in, inconsistent data, but you still don't have the context and the deep understanding of what that data is. And so where I see UBA uh, solutions winning is where they try to tackle one problem. So they say, look, we're going to really focus on lateral movement and understanding um, account takeover type situations, or we're going to look at um, outbound traffic to look for data exfiltration, basically at the, you know, the, the horse is already out of the barn and is leaving the yard. Um, what we're going to focus on today is more in this section is looking at sensitive data. So really drilling down into understanding behavioral analytics uh, and how users are interacting with sensitive data. So taking this one step further, looking at kind of the challenges of a UBA sitting on top of the SIM as it relates to sensitive data, let's say database logs, file logs, cloud access logs, the number one issue, and I'm going to focus on databases because this is where most organizations are starting, is availability. So databases are mission critical systems, and the DBA's job is to make them go fast, uh, to be highly available all the time, and uh, basically to not impact the business at all. When we start basically implementing logs to feed into this type of an architecture, the challenge is that we're impacting those database systems. So if you've ever gone to the DBAs and asked for logs, they're, they're going to start with giving you very, very little amount of logs. And the more you ask for, the more resistance you're going to get. And the issue is, um, most commonly, those logs are native logs. So they're logs that are being um, um, uh, created and stored on the database system. And the more logs you ask for, the more hit you're going to see on the database. So we see sometimes up to a 15 or 20 percent hit on the database itself. The other issue is that um, you're not going to get the, the full data you need. It's, it's, uh, it's not going to be the rich type of data that you're going to need in order to really leverage the full power of machine learning and UBA. So this is part of the problem we see in this type of architecture, again, when we're trying to solve the sensitive data access problem. The second issue is uh, cost. So many SIMs, and I'll, I'll take Splunk as, as an example because we see it a lot, actually use it internally is that um, smoke charges by, by data volume. So the more data that I throw over the fence to the SIM, the, the higher my cost is going to be. That leads to cost predictability issues, particularly when you're budgeting for um, the, the year ahead. Um, so that's definitely an issue. Um, the other issue is that it creates a lot of volume. So now we've got storage. Now we've got additional um, volumes of storage that may have sensitive data that I also need to look at protecting. So it creates some issues, not, on, not only in terms of cost, but also complexity. Um, the next section is tuning. Um, so you may have heard supervised and unsupervised learning if you've looked at the behavioral learning space. 
supervised learning basically means um, that someone's going to come in and they're going to do tuning. So a data scientist, either from the vendor or from your internal staff, is going to come in and they're going to apply um, their, their expertise to tuning the machine learning algorithms to make sense of all this data. And if you think about it, um, and you've got an organization with lots of different variety and lots of different data feeds, you can see why it would be required to have a professional data scientist come in and do that tuning. It kind of puts us right back into where we are with SIM, where we're writing advanced correlation rules and we've got to do supervised learning. So while maybe it's a little bit better, you still have some oversight. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, is basically where the vendor, let's say Imperva, that's creating the machine learning, is able to really tune those algorithms down very tightly so that you don't have to have professional services or additional data scientists or additional tuning come in because they've been able to tune those uh, algorithms very tightly to get the expected outcome. And as you can imagine in doing so, it helps to have one use case that you're trying to solve so that you're very focused on that tuning so that you don't get spread too thin and too wide. And the last uh, thing that I hear um, is um, uh, no blocking. So. In this architecture, basically, um, we've got logs, uh, basically passive logs, um, sometimes real time, typically near real time or, or looked at later, fed into a SIM, and then those logs are fed into a UBA. So naturally, this is not a, a, a real time blocking type of, uh, of, a, of an architecture. And the other issue is now I've got to write scripts or I've got to write followed actions now to each one of these um, blocking devices, which creates additional uh, customizations uh, which need to be maintained and tuned over time. So. Um, again, this architecture is the most common that I see um, in the, uh, the customers that I talk to, and these are some of the challenges. Um, I mentioned uh, you know, the volume. This is just an illustration of kind of a, a best practice architecture that we would recommend instead. And essentially what we're doing is um, capturing that data in a much more elegant way. So in a way, basically using very lightweight agents or network monitoring on the database itself, something that we've been doing for auditing and security purposes for 14 years. And the idea is instead of 15 to 20 percent um, hit on that database, you're going to see less than 1 percent, you know, very low percentiles. You've got um, uh, pressure release valves, if you will, if the, if the database uh, becomes too hot or uh, overburdened, we can turn off the monitoring so that performance and availability takes the, takes the, um, the, the, uh, the priority. So the idea is to be able to monitor not just bits and pieces, but to be able to monitor all database traffic without impacting that system. And to be able to um, send that large amount of data in such a way that, again, I'm not creating um, volume issues, I'm not creating storage issues. So we're doing compression. Um, we're, we're taking large amounts of database data and, and converting that into metadata that we can use to do the analytics on. So the end result is, is to apply the machine learning with the data that we monitor from the database so that when we send um, that to the SIM, um, instead of sending thousands and thousands or millions of logs, um, we're talking about maybe five or six actionable alerts per week, and we're seeing this in very, very large environments. So that when the SOC team um, you know, looks at this and tries to make sense of it and maybe write some additional correlation rules, they can do it in a more effective manner. All right, so let's talk about a couple of the other approaches that I hear. Um, we'll skip to number three here, build in-house. So build versus buy, right? Uh, I've heard from some organizations that have data scientists on staff or would like to bring them on staff and, and do some of this in-house. Uh, the main issue with this approach uh, is pretty obvious, right? It's time to value. Um, buying an off-the-shelf solution that's already been through and been tested in, in other enterprises is going to save you a lot of time, especially if you've got tons of other priorities and other projects on your plate. So while I do see this um, come up quite a bit uh, with uh, organizations that have a lot of people that have a lot of uh, expertise uh, within the sort of the data scientist world, um, it, it's, it's really not practical for organizations that need to move quickly to protect their sensitive data. So let's come back to number two, um, talking about um, compromised accounts. So I hear a lot from organizations that are focused on compromised accounts and they're implementing a variety of different types of solutions, whether it be uh, APT slice, uh, type solution or advanced uh, you know, antivirus, uh, sort of next generation antivirus. At the end of the day, the problem with this is it misses two key categories of users that have access to sensitive data and that's malicious and careless. So if we look at careless users, these are careless or negligent privileged accounts or users that have access to things like databases. Um, you know, they're borrowing service accounts, they're going around the normal change control in order to do their job, which can lead to risks and weaknesses within the organization. So being able to uncover careless behavior is something you really have to have a deep understanding of, uh, for example, database logs. And if you're trying to go too far and too thin, um, that's one of the categories that you're not going to understand because it doesn't, it doesn't show up as something that's an attack, it's something that's careless uh, that needs to be addressed as part of good security hygiene. 
The, the last category, malicious, is probably the hardest because these users know where all the traps are and they know how to get around them. And so it's very difficult when you've got an advanced malicious user in order to be able to detect those. And that requires this deep knowledge, being able to go past the sort of inch deep, a mile wide, to really have a, a deep understanding of the problem that you're trying to solve. So when we're talking about sensitive data and we're talking about database systems, it helps to kind of look at the, uh, the kill chain here. Um, and, and I'll kind of briefly explain this uh, UBA data breach kill chain where we've got reconnaissance, lateral movement, data access, and exfiltration. The idea here is if you can detect and stop a data breach at any one of these sections, then, then it's a success, right? So if we look at, at uh, the, the types of user profiles I just talked about, most of the security industry is focused here on recon and lateral movement. And so I'll just go ahead and draw in here compromised users. So for example, they're focused on monitoring, let's say, log in, log out to Active Directory, and then what happens after that. So uh, lateral movement within the organization. I see this very commonly with UBA discussions. They're focused on lateral movement. The problem is um, for careless and compromised users, they're not going to be detected at either of these stages because they're already legitimate users on the network. They don't need to do reconnaissance. Um, they're not going to use account takeover or account borrowing necessarily to to demonstrate or trigger an alert around lateral movement. So we really need to have uh, a deep understanding of data access in order to address these two other user categories of careless and malicious, which by the way, will help us also address compromised users. And if you focus here on exfiltration, the, again, the horse has already left the barn, is leaving the, leaving the yard, most uh, exfiltration type um, approaches with UBA are focused on data that's going out of the firewall and are looking at flows and not necessarily the context of the actual data itself. So if, if they're taking 100 rows out of the database per day, it's very low volume. It's not going to trigger something that's looking for exfiltration at the firewall, for example. So our argument here is that if you're focused on sensitive data protection and using UBA to solve this problem, you really need to focus at the data access layer. You need to focus at um, protecting the data where it lives, having a deep understanding of how users interact with the databases, the file systems, cloud repositories, big data, these other places where you've got huge data repositories, you really need to have a deep understanding of data. And if you're looking to say, well, which UBA should I invest with first? Because chances are you're gonna have to have a layered approach, multiple solutions. Our argument is you need to start with data access because you can address all three use cases here, whereas you're not gonna be able to address uh, careless and malicious users if you're only focused on compromised accounts. Hope the session was useful. Please join us for another on Whiteboard Wednesdays. Thank you.